Uh, talk to ask to talk about stand growth. Um, so not really talk about trees, but stand growth and growth and yield implications uh, from density management and thinning. So when we think about thinning, um, really thinning's really the major tool that we as managers have to really influence stand structure and stand development once we have a stand established. So we can plant different densities. We can come in early and thin. We can come in late and thin. And that density management can influence things like tree growth, stand yield, stand structure, quality, utilization, health, mostly on the east side, and then a whole host of things we've talked about today in terms of uh, habitat and other things. Now, I'm going to really talk about those, kind of those first two is what I'm going to talk about. Um, 1960 through 1980, I think is kind of the golden age of density management research, a lot of work was done in this region for Douglas fir. Uh, early on in the late 50s, late 60s, early 60s, a lot of interest in commercial thinning, but we were dealing with a lot of natural, high density um, stands. So a lot of work uh, by folks like um, Rukuma did early density management in plantations, or, and early density management in those natural stands and plantations. And the idea was to move these stands along and produce larger trees so they can move up and reduce the number of years to commercial thinning. Once we get in the 60s and, and uh, or the 70s and 80s, uh, thinning cooperatives started. The levels of growing stock study, uh, really looking at a range of densities and what happens to uh, growth growing stock relationships, uh, really was foundational in a lot of our understanding of this. Uh, Regional Forest Nutrition Research Project, really a fertilization co-op, but built-in thinnings. And then in the 80s, the stand management co-op, looking at a range of densities from uh, late co commercial thinning, pre-commercial type thinnings, and even planting densities. So when we look at growth, you know, most anything, a cumulative growth, um, we all know we have this kind of sigmoidal shaped curve. And we could think of this uh, on the y-axis as something like biomass, carbon, volume, tree size. Now this early phase goes into almost a linear growth phase, it's an inflection point, and then it still increases but at a decreasing rate. Well, as mensurationists, growth and yield folks, we see this all the time. On the left is a typical site index curve, height age curve, we see that kind of trend. Uh, on, the, on the right, we see volume on the, on the y-axis over age. Again, you know, we see that sigmoidal shaped curve. Now, I could have graphed that on the, on the right over height, and it would have been a nice little group. But I kept those separate because I wanted to make a uh, over age because we see what's happening is this range of productivity. We have low sites on the bottom, that dark line, to much higher sites on the top line. So I'm not really talk about productivity today, but productivity matters, whether it's site index, or gross primary production or whatever, um, productivity matters and how that stand develops. So as biometricians, we think in terms of the rate of growth. And um, we think of that, that periodic annual growth or current annual growth. So if we take a growth period, say between age 20 and 25, and divide that by five, we get a periodic annual growth. And so that, that fast up peaking curve, that's that average periodic growth. Peaks early and then declines. So things like height growth and, and diameter growth tend to peak very early, uh, volume growth a little later. But then we also look at a mean growth rate, the mean annual increment, that lower curve. Uh, again, starts slow, kind of goes up in flexion and then um, flattens out. The mean annual increment curve. And where the current annual increment intersects the mean annual increment, that's that point of maximum average growth rate. We call it culmination of mean annual increment. And that culminates obviously uh, beyond the, the, the periodic annual increment. And so this is a lot of what we think about in terms of our management. Um, things like uh, in natural stands, unmanaged stands, where we start seeing uh, points of differentiation. That's up there where that culmination is starting to get uh, there. Uh, if we value things like structure and things without thinning, um, we're tending to look at rotations up there. If we're looking at maximize net present value and things like that, it might move us more to the left. 
So if we look at thinning, we'll take this uh, site 125, so modest, nice site, uh, well stocked. It's actually plantation, but a lot of ingrowth, so there's a lot of trees. Uh, six thinnings, uh, very frequent inter intervals. Get this range of, of stocking. So we can see uh, down below all the, uh, the nice thinning curves. Uh, they go out, they drop down, they thin, not much mortality. But now we see uh, on the red line, a little bit of ingrowth, and then it starts dropping due to mortality. So as we're going to follow this stand through uh, during this talk a little bit. So if we look at, at yield, one of the things early on folks thought, well, if we thin, we'll capture the mortality and we'll get bonus wood. And what the research has shown in a number of species over the years is, well, you just don't get bonus wood. We just don't capture. And in this, the, the, the bottom line is the heavy thinning and has the lowest, lowest yield, same site. Uh, the red line is the, the control. That's that heavy, heavy stock stand. And we can see that it runs up above and then basically comes in about the same volume as the lightest thinning. So we don't really gain a lot of volume by thinning. And we'll talk about that as, as we go along. So then if we look at mean annual increment and periodic annual increment, uh, the dark line on the bottom is the heavy thinning. The solid red line is the control. The dotted lines are the same color, a little hard to see, I'm sorry, uh, are the periodic annual increment. And so if we're looking for that culmination point, what we see is in this particular, this is total stem volume that at about age, uh, looks like about age 50 or so, the control plots and lightest thinnings look like they're probably about ready at culmination. Now there's a lot of bouncing around because of weather and mortality and all kinds of other things, but the heavy thinning is still quite a ways from culminating. So thinning extends that culmination point. Uh, and as we see, we, if we go to a merchantability limit, uh, it, it extends it even more. Now folks like Curtis, and uh, Newton have, have shown this several times in several papers and shown, well, this is to advantage if you're looking for certain structural types of things where you want to extend rotation because we can uh, continue to push that, that growth continues. So one of the things, well, why, why don't we get this bonus wood and, and why, why do we get this lower growth? This is uh, um, taken after, after an interesting article by, by Everett. I've tried to show it graphically. If you think of the blue as your bank account, this is the growing stock. This is stuff that's in the bank. And on the left is a control plot. Lots of stuff in the bank. Um, and it's growing at 372 cubic feet per acre per year. On the right is the thin plot. We've removed some of that capital. That blue is just smaller. And it's only growing 319. That's the green. So you see what's happened is that even though we may get more growth on an individual tree basis, the, the green, height's about the same. And we have so much more capital to put that growth on in the control plot that we've, we're getting more growth. This is the, the growth, the volume side of growth growing stock relationships. This is why when we thin, we don't necessarily get bonus wood because we've reduced our capital. So this gets to what this commonly affectionately called the Langsetter relationship. And Langsetter kind of looked at this particular curve, this idealized curve, in, in several zones. In zone ones, we get a growth that's essentially proportional to growing stock. So growing stock could be basal area, relative density, leaf area, volume, whatever it is. That's your capital that you're growing on. Once you get up to zone two, we're starting competition. And our growth rate is slowing down a little bit. Um, but we're still high, at our highest growth rate. In zone three, which he theorized was kind of a plateau, we get our maximum growth rate, and then we may see at higher densities a falling off of growth. So if we look at the data, this is an example of that same stand. And we see on the bottom is the start of the period basal area. That's our capital and the volume growth. And we see that at low, low basal areas, um, we've reduced that capital, we reduced our growth, just as that Everett um, graph showed. Once we get up to uh, you know, 125, we start seeing that curving, Langsetter part two. And then, interestingly, whether you talk about gross growth or net growth. If you talk about gross growth, that's the total production of the stand, that's that red dot, we start seeing a little bit of a plateau. 
But if we're talking about net growth, which take out the mortality, the actual growth you see out there, and we start seeing that bend over and we see kind of a peak. Now here's the conundrum with growth growing stock relationships. If we maintain high capital, high basal area, high growing stock, we get high growth. If we reduce it, we reduce our stand growth. Well, just the opposite if we look at diameter growth, tree growth, average tree growth. Um, what happens is at very high densities, the trees, individual trees grow less. And at low densities, they grow more, just the opposite. This is the uh, challenge of the manager, but the opportunity of the manager to use that relationship to identify and get these structures and, and things that they want to get out of their um, thinning and management. So if we just look at this over time, from age, uh, oh, age 10 to age 50, you can see that the, the black line at the, at the bottom of the, the right graph and the black line there at the top, that's the lightest thinning. Ends up with the biggest trees, but the least amount of volume. That's the trade-off. Where the red is the control plot, the heaviest density. It's got the smallest trees, but it's got about the, the most volume. So you see this. This is out of Hoskins. Uh, on the left is a control plot. You see a lot of small stems. Uh, not much uh, stuff on the ground, so there's, not, there's a lot of leaf area, not a lot of light getting through. If we were to look up, it'd be small crowns, but a lot of leaf area. On the right, the thin plots, fewer, lot fewer trees, um, bigger stems, much, much bigger stems. Uh, they're all alive, there's no dead. Uh, if we looked up, there would be big crowns, but a lot less leaf area, and we see an understory developing. Those are that, those two extremes. So what happens? When we look at growing space, really what we're managing growing space. The foresters, we don't want to talk about growing space because it's hard to measure. But what we're really doing is managing that growing space. And so thinning provides more growing space to a tree, at least temporarily. So more resources per tree, more water, more light, more nutrients. And that gives more average tree growth. But we get less site utilization, less growing stock, less total leaf area, and less stand growth, the trade-off. So um, if, if we take a, a stand, we've actually some stem map, and we look on the a horizontal axis is the growing space, the growing area, and that's in 100 square foot classes. And you can see, as we, uh, uh, as we increase our growing space, so as we're going to the right, we get more growth. And as we have less growing space, there at the left, we have less growth. Of course, there's a lot of variation. So the other trade-off is, well, if we're interested in snags and things like that, um, we need density. And so if we look at the typical self-thinning trajectory, the red line goes up, hits at some point, and starts, starts the mortality. Now, that's our graph that we saw that essentially has the highest growth rates. So if we see that, that kind of secondary line coming down, I probably have a pointer here someplace. So I can get it to work. Oh, wrong way. Eh, pointed to myself. Yeah, so this line right here. So right around there is where we're looking at our maximum stand growth. Down here, we're looking at our maximum tree growth. And so as the manager, identifying our objectives and where do we want to manage within this framework in order to get the objectives we want, whether it be big trees, more volume, uh, snags, whatever. So what dictates the response? It's really important. Well, the stand we've got, we need to identify what really is going to happen in terms of that response. So tree vigor is really important. And we often think of that in terms of crown. Do we have adequate crown? Crown to build. Can we build crown? Do we have crown? Um, and so um, we also think of that in terms of age uh, as those stands grow. And a number of folks have said, yeah, um, older stands can respond. Certainly young stands, as we just saw in height growth, they put on height growth a lot faster than old stands. They'll build crowns faster. They'll respond better. But old stands, older stands can respond. Uh, Williamson is shown, uh, Curtis, uh, Robertson, Har Harrington, 
uh, shown 60, 70, 80, 100 year old stands will respond to thinning, just not like young stands. Interestingly, the one that Curtis in 1995, a 60 year old, originally they abandoned that because they didn't see response in it. But he came back years later and yes, it had responded. It just took time for it to build that crown. Um, residual density, well, we've already talked about that. And again, this is that trade off up above. Where are we on that, that growing stock line in terms of, of our growth response? Heavy, heavy thinning, moving to the left, will reduce our growth. But as the bottom line shows, that's where our biggest tree growth is going to be. As we build our, our regimes that we want to trade off between those two things. Now, the other part of this is holding time. How long are you going to hold it? And so this, that top graph and the bottom graph, time really moves along those lines as we build growing stock. Um, oops, went too far. Number of competitors. So how many competitors do we leave? This is, um, if we look at base layer and larger, how much base layer do we have bigger than me? And clearly if we on, on the left side of that graph, those are your dominant trees. Those are the ones that are going to grow really well. Whereas those trees um, on, the left, on the right have a lot of competition and after we thin them, they're just not going to grow as much because they don't have the crown to, to expand quickly and, and take up the space. Um, we often think in terms of D to D ratio. Uh, nice wood. Uh, D to D ratio, and so the diameter of the trees we cut to the diameter of the trees uh, that were there before the cut. Um, so we think about what trees are we taking out. Um, this is just on the top is some work by Stabler, look at dominant, co-dominant, intermediates. One of the things we see is all of those crown classes in this particular stand released. Well, this was a dense natural stand and all of them were able to respond. Uh, obviously, the, the trees that had nice big crowns were able to really take advantage of the situation and, and release quite well. The bottom graph is a plantation. It's a younger stand, less dense. Well, they already had nice growing space and were growing really well. So there was really not much of a response across there consistent. It wasn't significant. So what kinds of trees do we leave? So we think about the vigor of the stand we have to work with, the residual density we want, and the D to D ratio. What kinds of trees are we going to take? What kinds of trees are we going to leave? Those are going to dictate the kind of stand we have. So two slides on variable density. So think about variable density. Gaps, uh, creating openings, uh, develop understory, uh, encourage regeneration skips those areas we don't thin, um, we can get snags and um, down wood, and then areas we thin outside the gap. And the bottom is a, a picture from Connie Harrington. You can see gaps, patches, skips, all those kinds of things. And so basically all the things I've just talked about, all this science that was done essentially in even age stands, I think applies to this variable density. It's just scale. We have those areas of high density, high volume growth, but low tree, tree size growth. We have areas that are thin, which will reduce our volume growth, increase our stand growth. And so we see here, uh, I'll just point to the bottom one. This is, uh, again, Harrington's work, um, un unthinned, thinned, and gap edges. We can see that one of the things that variable density brings us is that range of tree size development, and depending on where we're at. Um, so building in greater heterogeneity. So it becomes scale. How much area do we have in each one of these conditions and how does that affect our growth growing stock relationships? So thinning young stands likely increase uh, individual tree growth, result in larger trees. Thinning will likely cause an initial reduction in total stand growth, at least in the short term, as growing stock builds. Thinning should not be expected to create substantial amounts of free or bonus wood. And then I'd say all these kinds of things really uh, are applicable to variable density, but the question is scale. How much do we have in each one of these kinds of things in terms of how that develops uh, as, as a full stand? Thank you. Are there any questions?
keeps on time going. I'm like an older forester, and I still go back to clear cuts and how well we could use wood in our full product. As a private industry forester, is there a way, what would be the optimal mix in terms of actually producing economic value for your company versus adding these other values? Well, I don't think there is a sweet, the sweet spot depends on your objectives. My company is not like another company. It's not like a state agency or federal agency. And that's why, I think when you look at that MAI curve, where do you want to manage on that? And where my company might want to manage one space, you'll find another company will be another space, whereas a federal agency looking at um, late successional types of things may want to be at the, the, the far right of that. And I think that's where this is the real advantage of the manager, to be able to manage growth growing stock relationships to find the sweet spot for your objectives. And as a forester, that's the importance of understanding growth growing stock relationships, the trade-off, and then allowing the civil culturist to help guide you to meet that objective through that sweet spot for your organization. As a private company, how many of these alternative treatments are you doing? relative to traditional clear cuts? Well, again, uh, different companies will have different, different objectives, and m many companies have, have their standard objective, uh, and most of their acres will be that. But uh, it's, again, it depends on the company and what they want to do. There are companies that run uh, extended rotations. Uh, there are companies that do shorter rotations.